All right, I'll get started. We're at the top of the hour. Greetings, everyone, and thank you for attending this month's science seminar presented by the NSF's National Ecological Observatory Network, which is operated by Battelle. Our goal with this monthly series of talks is to build community among researchers at the intersection of ecology, environmental science, and neon. We are excited to have Manoj Hari here to present today. But before we turn it over to Manoj, a few logistics. So we have enabled optional automated closed captioning for today's talk. If you'd like to use it, please find the CC button in your Zoom menu bar. The webinar will consist of a presentation followed by a Q&A session. As you think of questions throughout the talk, please do add them to the Q&A box. That would be preferred over the chat box, whereas in the chat, you can share links, introduce yourself, kind of use that as more of a networking space um, and put questions for the speaker in the Q&A if you can. We'll then facilitate a, a discussion at the end and there will also be an opportunity to unmute and um, ask questions over audio if you would like. NEON welcomes contributions from everyone who shares our values of creativity, unity, collaboration, excellence, and appreciation. This can be found uh, the, on, in our code of conduct, uh, which is found on our science seminars webpage. So let me do a quick screen share of that. So um, here is, is our webpage showing all of the talks included in the science seminar series. And if you go all the way down to the bottom of this page, you can find our code of conduct. I'll drop the link to the webpage in the chat in a moment. And so obviously this applies to anyone, um, all the staff at EON and anyone attending our event. So thank you so much for following the code of conduct. This talk will be recorded and made available for later viewing on this very NEON Science Seminars webpage. We can see all of the previous talks up here with links to the recorded presentations. And this last talk will be, the recording will be added um, soon, probably end of this week or early next. To complement our monthly science seminars, we host related data skills webinars on how to access and use NEON data. We are complete with our data skills webinars for this year, but there will be uh, more webinars starting up after a summer break. So look for more of those in the fall. Um, and of course, we do have a venue for nominating speakers for the seminar series. And so if you can think of someone who might give a, a great presentation, please don't be shy to nominate them here. Okay, now I will turn it over to Dave Durden to introduce today's talk and today's speaker. Thank you, Samantha. <clears throat> so should be sharing my screen now. Um, so I just wanted to give a kind of brief introduction to the NCAR NEON uh, system um, and how it's kind of bridging the ecological and climate sciences. Um, the idea behind the NCAR NEON system was to kind of remove the barriers to enable integrating NEON ecological observations with NCAR or the National Center for Atmospheric Research uh, Earth system models. And through this, we believe that we can enable exciting scientific discoveries, such as predicting changes in terrestrial processes, understanding changes at and across uh, continental scale, and disentangling complex ecological interactions uh, between the climate and the, the land surface. We recently uh, submitted a paper um, describing this system to, and, and it's currently in review at EGU Sphere. Um, so we, we hope that uh, we will provide a link to this so people can look into that if they're interested. Um, but to kind of just give a, a little overview, this is kind of a conceptual model describing the, the NCAR NEON framework where we're taking NEON observations, uh, gap filling and partitioning those um, to enable those to be ingested into the community land model um, or the CESM lab, which was created as part of this project. Um, it's a containerized version of CLM um, that can be ran anywhere, uh, even on your laptop. Uh, and then ultimately using the, the simulated 
flux data and comparing that against um, the observed NEON data to both help Im improve our data quality and, and to help us uh, better understand the model processes and model parameterization. Uh, lastly, I um, just wanted to, to mention that, you know, now we have these kind of accessible framework for CLM simulation, um, and you can run the community land model even on your laptop. Um, there's a lot of great tutorials available uh, that can show you how to use this containerized system um, to run a CLM simulation and how to visualize and evaluate the model data uh, in a Python, uh, Python Jupyter Notebook kind of uh, interface. Um, you can see the link here at the bottom of the slide. So with that, I would like to introduce to you Manoj Hari. He is a PhD candidate at the National Institute of Technology, Rorkela in Odisha, India, in the Department of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences. For the last 10 months, Manoj has been a visiting doctoral researcher at NCAR in the Climate and Global Dynamics Group, working with Dr. Danica Lombardazzi. Manoj worked with Dr. Lombardazzi on outputs from the NCAR NEON framework in conjunction with satellite remote sensing data. The title of his talk today is Synergies Between the Community Land Model and satellite proxies in capturing the terrestrial carbon dynamics at NEON sites. And with that, I will stop sharing and turn it over to Manoj. Thanks, Dave. Uh, that was a wonderful introduction. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, myself, Manoj, and I'm a doctoral candidate from India. And I've been working with Dr. Bhishma Tyagi over here in the Department of Earth and Atmospheric Science. And uh, most of my work has been uh, like entangled to understand uh, the uh, background process of terrestrial carbon cycle at a regional scale. Where uh, in, in terms of region, I just mostly focus over India. Um, sorry. Ah, OK. Uh, well, uh, for the past 10 months, I've been working with Dr. Danica Lambrodusi at uh, National Center for Atmospheric Research. Uh, with a Fulbright project that I've been engaged over there, where uh, we were working on uh, NCAR NEON framework, where we tried to understand uh, how uh, carbon flux has been uh, changing at different sites based upon different uh, ecological and climatical background. So uh, uh, based on that one, we try to understand how uh, satellite data has been used or like infused within this uh, model structural framework in order to understand the overall uh, dynamics of carbon at each site level. So with that, like I'll just jump into the uh, research that we did. Next, please. So uh, initially, I'll just give you a broad uh, outline about the proxies, like the satellite data that I've been using for this analysis. Uh, satellite has a, a very uh, broad facility in order to uh, like trace the carbon like across globe. Uh, the one uh, background, one uh, facility, facility that it promotes is like, even though flux networks across US are like globe has a precise me measurements of flux uh, of carbon and water flux, uh, they are like site confined. But in comes when it comes to the pro uh, satellite data, they do have like synergies along with the flux flux networks. But it captures the whole uh, spatial extent which uh, the flux network cannot be done. So for this analysis, we tried to understand, uh, like, understand uh, a key factor for the carbon flux, which is considered to be the gross primary productivity. Well, uh, gross primary productivity is considered to be uh, like uh, the uptake of carbon by the plants, and uh, the key flux, which is uh, modulates these dynamics, is considered to be the gross primary productivity. So when it comes to the satellite. Uh, there is no such satellite uh, have a direct observations of GPP. So we do have like different proxies as a uh, as a measurement of GPP. So we just like try to compare the observations along with different proxies. One such proxy is called uh, NARV, which is uh, like a, a normalized, uh, I mean, array reflectance for vegetation. But uh, for this proxy, we derived all the uh, all the characteristics from uh, modus reflectance band. 
the spectral properties is like it try to matches with almost 68 percentage as of uh, gpp observation uh, the spatial extent of this uh, sorry the spatial resolution of this narv is around 500 meter where we try to fr frame it on the pro on the footprint of the each flux tower at different locations next please the next uh, advancement of proxy that we used is like called KNDVA, which is Kernelized Normalized Differential Vegetation Index, which is considered to be the advanced version of NARV, where they have a sigma parameter which has dynamic infusion within the flux networks, I mean, sorry, within, within the reflectance product, as they can able to trace uh, the flux variations at like greater extent. Again, we we try to uh, extend expand this product uh, with the same modus reflectance band, and with a 500 meter resolution, we try to confine it at like site level based analysis. The map over here, you can you can see that like that's the global extent of KNDVA, where we try to map on a global scale, where you could see higher uh, KNDVA values, which is uh, which is obviously unitless, where you could see the higher KNDVA values on always on the tropics. Next, please. So the other proxies, which is considered to be much more closer to GPP is called SIF, which is solar induced, induced flu uh, fluorescence, where uh, we try to extract the, uh, this proxy uh, from tropomy SIF, which is, which is having a higher resolution in order to trace SIF at site level. So there are, the spatial extent for this uh, SIF is about like 3.5 into 7.5 kilometers square, like at the, at the nadal level where they try to capture SIF at a daily scale. Uh, the advantage of having SIF is like they are considered to be the direct proxy compared to the, uh, the earlier proxy that I told. Next, please. So uh, by using these three proxies, we try to uh, understand the variability at different uh, neon sites all across over there in the US. So uh, we, uh, we again used NCAR neon uh, system in order to simulate site level simulations using the community land model, which has a concept of uh, biogeochemical concept. And we try to simulate at a half hourly temporal scale at, uh, at different sites. So uh, the, main, uh, the main theme around that reflects around this pro pro uh, on, uh, about this process is we need to compare how well CTSM, I mean, a CLM, the neon sites and the synergies, I mean, uh, the proxies are capturing the uh, carbon dynamics and how it has been varying at different time scale. Next, please. So for this, we uh, framed a structural uh, analysis beh behind this uh, theme. So the initial uh, uh, idea behind this analysis was to understand how uh, satellite proxies has been uh, like much more uh, equivalent with CSM and uh, in-situ analysis in capturing the carbon dynamics. And uh, we want to trace the uh, pattern of GPP across different gradients based upon temporal, based upon their vegetational background and their climatic background. And further, we need to extrapolate this analysis from the, from the point scale to the global scale. So based on this one, we framed our workflow. Next, please. Uh, we framed our workflow and different uh, parameter st structure. So initially, we tried to understand how well this uh, proxies has been modulated by different global environmental parameters. And we classified these sites based upon different vegetational backgrounds, which is called like PFTs. We, uh, PFTs is nothing but plant functional type uh, categories where we, uh, we just like lean towards the CLMs uh, PFT types because in order to have an ambiguity across the global scale. And further in terms of climate, so we classified uh, the sites based upon Copen climatic classification. And further, we, uh, like for the whole data period, we just temporarily bin the data at different scales. Next, please. So uh, when it comes to the NEON sites, obviously NEON has a, a lot of uh, sites all across US, but our focus is mostly confined to the corners, I mean, the contiguous US, where it ha NEON has around 47 sites, but 39 is considered to be the most prominent, which is in corners, and eight are in Alaska, Hawaii, and the other islands. Next, please. Oh, the background image over here is just like uh, uh, the, uh, high resolution of CTSM simulations, the average annual period for the whole uh, analyzing period. So for this analysis, we are just selecting 28 sites, which is highlighted here, 
which has a, 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 which has a consistent data flow and has CTSM simulations enabled site. So uh, next please. Further, these sites has been uh, like categorized based upon their uh, PFT back, their, based upon their climatic background. For example, if you could see uh, the top left corner, the square where it indicates the site, which is having a background of warm summer Mediterranean climate. When it comes to uh, the circle, obviously it does like it belongs to humid subtropical climate where the neon has 12 sites, which, is, which comes under that category. The site that has red marks is represented where the site doesn't have a proper data flow, where we had an in-situ uh, data gaps in this uh, in this site. So we just want to mark this site. Further, next please. Further, we again classified these sites based upon their plant functional types, which is uh, uh, which is obviously based upon their vegetational characteristics. The buffer, uh, the highlighted buffer over here, each color represents a different climatic. Uh, sorry, the uh, plant functional types. For example, the blue one represents the cropland, the yellow represents the deciduous broadleaf forest, and the red one evergreen needle forest, and the violet it's grassland, and the green is uh, open shrubland. So again, if you just take out uh, the la uh, the top left uh, site, that site represents uh, a warm summer Mediterranean climate. Again, that site where the PFT is being considered to be evergreen needle forest. So that's how we classify each site based upon their climatic background as well as on the PFT background. Next, please. So in order to consider uh, anal like uh, the uh, in order to give the results just for this presentation sake, we just uh, picked up very few sites in order to represent our overall analysis. So we selected uh, the sites in such a way each, it, each site represents each of the PFTs and uh, all the climatic backgrounds has been included in our analysis so that like you could see the diverse uh, nature of fluxes across different sites. Next, please. So uh, initially we started our analysis by uh, understanding the diurnal flux across different sites. And uh, you could see the green bins that has been represented here are like half hourly, half hourly fluxes, flux variations across uh, that has been mean for the whole analyzing period, where the red solid line represents the CTSM simulations, whereas the blue solid line represents the neon uh, the neon observation mean. So uh, the gray shaded uh, region represents the day period, and obviously the white one represents the night period. So in this way, like we structurally frame uh, to in order to see the diurnal flux variations across different uh, different climatic as well as the PFT background. Next, please. If you could see uh, the the, uh, the highlighted box over here, these two sites represent uh, the deciduous broadleaf characteristics of vegetation. However, they do have a different climatic background, irrespective of the climatic background. Just like uh, because of just because of the PFTs, you could see uh, compared to all the other sites, uh, the CTSM simulations over these two uh, deciduous broadleaf sites has been underrepresented than the neon observations. Uh, next, please. In case. On the other hand, if you could see the uh, the evergreen needle forest, which is highlighted in red, all the others, uh, irrespective of uh, the evergreen needle background, these sites has different uh, climatic background, and each climatic background has a different flux variation at diurnal scale. This shows both uh, PFTs as well as climate has a distinct variable variable influence in modulating the flux across different sites. Next, please. So, in order to understand uh, the variability of uh, environmental factors, we try to understand uh, how uh, the atmospheric dryness or like the BPD, which is vapor pressure deficit, is modulating the energy partitioning across these sites. So for this, uh, if you could see the plot over here, the uh, the solid black line represents the uh, the neon observations, sorry, the BPD neon observations, whereas the red one uh, indicates the CTSM simulations. But you could see uh, each site has a distinct representation of uh, like having a different response in terms of VPD. Whereas, next slide please. Whereas, if you overlay the neon observation sites, which is like highlighted black, where there is a lot of mismatch between the simulations as well as the observation. Next please. If, uh, if you could particularly see the, uh, the highlighted plot, irrespective of uh, their PFT background, you could see a lot of mismatch between the simulations, simulated uh, latent heat and the uh, uh, observation latent heat at different sites. This means that like it, uh, the CTSM, like the CLM has a background of uh, algorithms in such a way that like it has 
uh, normalize all the uh, PFT backgrounds. So irrespective of the site, uh, site's generic nature. Next, please. So uh, in order to consider the influence of different environmental variables, we try to understand, like to understand the correlations between different uh, environmental variables such as temperature, precipitation, latent heat, and VPD. So for this, we uh, spatially just like correlated each site's uh, GPP observations along with the observed temperature. The sites over here has been uh, like has been highlighted over here, depending upon the correlations that has been correlated with GPP neon as well as the temperature. Next, please. The pie chart over here it represents the first pie graph represents PFTs ratio, whereas the second one second pie graph represents climate backgrounds ratio, where the 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 divisions in the pie chart represents the ratio between each PFTs. That means. For example, if you consider the yellow in the first pie chart, all the deciduous broadleaf sites has been cumulatively ratio in such a way that like it all uh, it represents the sites has been represented in a single frame. So if, if you could see uh, the ratio between uh, other sites, considerably GPP neon and having a very good relation, especially in the deciduous broadleaf site factors. Next, please. In such a way, we uh, again correlated with. G, uh, precipitation, VPD, and latent heat, but unfortunately, we couldn't able to establish a proper relation with precipitation, especially with the observed precipitation, except for grassland, where you could see a higher, uh, very higher ratio of uh, like correlation just for precipitation. But other than that, uh, irrespective of the sites, we couldn't able to establish a very good relation. But when it comes to latent heat. Uh, except for the uh, the shrubland sites, which is marked on the green, uh, it has a very good relation, especially for the grassland as well as for the deciduous broadleaf site. So this shows each environmental factors is playing uh, differently at different sites based upon their climatic and PFT background. Next, please. So further, we just want to check whether the simulation is going along with the observation. So that's right. We just like uh, simulated the observations as well as uh, sorry, we simulated. Uh, the GPP as well as the temperature, and we just like correlated with, with along with different PFTs. Sorry, uh, across sites. It seems that like again, precipitation doesn't give a very good correlation at these sites. But uh, compared to the observations here, the simulator of GPP and VPD has a very good relation compared to the latent heat which we saw in the earlier slide. Next, please. So in this way, again, CTSM is having a very, a very differential opinion in compared to the observations. So now we are uh, just like, I'm just shifting my focus towards the satellite based observations. The plot here represents the uh, daily bin of GPP observations, which is, which is obviously the X axis, whereas the Y axis represents the CTSM simulations where we normalized the bins in order to fit all the other proxies in the analysis, where you could see uh, the evergreen needle for us, which is the first bar, we have we are, where you could see a very good relation between the neon observations and the CTSM simulations. Uh, the uh, the vertical lines over there in the bins that represents uh, the standard error within the simulation. So that's uh, I need to mention it over here. But next one, please. But when we overlay the other proxy, which is KNDVA, where it has a dynamic relation at different PFTs. Again, uh, we do have a mismatch in data gaps because like uh, the uh, the data swap that has been provided by Modus is around like eight days. So again, we do have data gaps in each site. For example, uh, if you could see the panels in the middle where you could see that you couldn't able to establish a proper uh, relation because of data gaps. But for the sites on the middle, I mean, I mean the middle panel on the left side, where you could see for the grassland, it has a very good relation. Similarly, over on the top right, where you could see a very good relation with observations as well as with the CTSM. Next, next slide, please. Similarly, we again overlaid with SIF, which is in blue bins, sorry, green bins, where compared to uh, the uh, KNDVA, again, uh, SIF is having like outrunning all the other proxies. They try to, irrespective of their uh, uh, PFT background and the climate background, they try to always try to go along with CTSM at like uh, in most of the sites, but uh, when they go with the uh, with uh, observations just for the uh, like a higher canopy architecture such as deciduous broadleaf or evergreen sites. Next please. 
so what we need what we plan to do is like we try to annually uh, like we, need, we just like average it in order to see the annual dynamics as well as the seasonal dynamics and how this fluxes has been changing at different sites and how it has been modulated at different proxy levels so here we just like uh, for the whole analyzing period we just annually made the uh, annually averaged the, in order to see the climatology and the, the black solid line again it represents the neon observations and the bar graph represents the uh, the seasonal dynamics at different seasons from winter spring summer and fall uh, next slide please you could see over here just over these three panels where we couldn't able to establish the proper annual or the seasonal dynamics that's because again we do uh, these are the sites where we had the data gaps so we couldn't able to establish a proper relation in terms of annual dynamics or seasonal dynamics next please but when we overlay it with ctsm simulations like the simulations we had a difference or like contrasting uh, analyzing opinions especially for higher canopy structure as well as for the deciduous broadleaf tree again if you could see the middle top uh, the middle panel which represents a deciduous broadleaf forest where it has been underrepresented under simulated compared to the neon observation similarly the last panel last panel in the in the middle sector where again it is a deciduous broadleaf forest but compared to all the other sector where you could see the ctsm simulations over overestimated compared to the neon observations and similarly this way again the seasonality has been changed depending upon uh, mostly over in the summer season next slide please surprisingly when we overlaid the sif observations over these particular sites we could see that like sif has uh, is going with different is in favor of different prop, uh, different sites for example uh, if you could see uh, the uh, the middle i mean the uh, first panel in the middle first panel in the middle where you could see uh, which represents a grassland where it goes with the neon sorry it goes with the ctsm simulations so again similarly uh, the uh, sites that has lower ca canopy architectures such as disney on the top right where you could see it goes along with the uh, neon uh, sorry ctsm simulations both in terms of uh, annual dynamics as well as in the seasonal dynamics but apart from those uh, for uh, the evergreen and uh, the deciduous broadleaf forest the uh, surprisingly been, uh, uh, SIF tries to go capture the dynamics. It goes along with the neon observation, but it doesn't go with the uh, CTSM. So it means that like uh, SIF has a capability to capture go uh, in terms of uh, higher canopy architecture. Whereas when it comes to uh, the lower bottom panel, no, uh, like none of this is matching with either with the observations or with simulations. So we couldn't able to establish a proper uh, a compatibility along with these different proxies. Next, please. So uh, these are all the uh, evergreen needle forest and the deciduous broadleaf forest, where you could see that there has been like uh, the SIF tries to go along with the neon observations. Next, please. Whereas uh, over here, these are all the sites, which is again grassland and cropland, where it goes along with the CTSM simulations. Next, please. So further, in order to find uh, like how well it has been going with the at different temporal means. We classified our data at, uh, from daily scale to interannual bins based upon uh, like different temporal bins. So for this, like over here, we uh, like normalized all the data in order to fit everything in the graph. Where the green bin, the, where the green uh, bar represents the neon observations, and the horizontal uh, green line represents the uh, the mean neon observations. Where the red bar represents the CTSM simulations where for especially for the dbf uh, deciduous broadleaf forest where it has been underrepresented similarly all the other proxies is overrepresented next slide please likewise we try to uh, do the analysis for daily weekly monthly seasonal to interannual we just bin the data at different uh, temporal bins in order to see the analysis irrespective of the temporal bins it seems that like ctsm is underrepresented at different bins whereas there has been a lot of fluctuations in terms of uh, in terms of proxies, as you could see, compared to daily bins, for the monthly bins of uh, KNDVA, which is like uh, at the, the the black bin, where you could see the lot of that bin, there is a lot of fluctuations, and it seems that like it's trying to match with the uh, observations. Next slide, please. 
Likewise, we try to capture for different uh, PFTs, like cropland, evergreen native crops, grassland, and shrubland. Next please. So each has distinct uh, representation of site. But then our focus has, has been limited to three uh, distinct PFTs. Next one, please, which is deciduous, evergreen, and grassland. That's because you could see the red, you, uh, you can concentrate just on the uh, red uh, bar where you could see there's been a lot of uh, changes, especially from daily scale to interannual scale. From uh, even if you get just take grassland, irrespective of evergreen or deciduous broadleaf forest. In this way, we again find a pattern where there's been a lot of fluctuations happened, especially from if we just go along with the temporal scale as well. Next, please. Likewise, we compare the analysis based upon their climatic background, where the major of this uh, climatic uh, fluctuations has been found in the DFB, which is hot summers uh, humid climate. Next, please. So we try to, again, uh, restrict our focus just on CFK and DFB in order to see the analysis. But com comparing the others, other uh, climate background, these two sites has a major dominance of evergreen needle forest and the deciduous uh, broadleaf forest. And that's why you could see uh, the CTSM has been underrepresented in DBF uh, climate background. Next, please. So uh, again, likewise, we, we just like compare CTSM with different proxies at different uh, temporal uh, different temporal scales in order to have how structurally it has been uh, diversified at different sites. So here you could see uh, it has been diversified across different sites from uh, when we compare the sim CTSM simulations with the observation. Next one, please. Similarly, we just did the analysis for daily winds just for KNDVA, NARV, and SIP at different proxies. Unfortunately, we couldn't, we couldn't properly establish a very good relation with different proxies except for SIP. SIP tried to capture a very good, uh, in, try to replicate along with the NEON. Uh, but unfortunately, neither KNDVA nor NARV could able to again uh, could able to replicate the observations, and uh, un they do have a site which has a negative correlation as well. Next one, please. Where it has been marked here, but this is the particular site where uh, which has a ba background of deciduous broadleaf site, and I, like, still we are puzzled then why we couldn't able to have a very good relation just for this site, and we are trying to analyze the environmental background for these sites as well. Next one, please. Similarly, again, another uh, deciduous broadleaf site has a has comparatively higher correlation compared not compared to the observations as well. They do have a very good relation with CTSM observations and the proxies. So this is just for the daily temporal bins. Next, please. Similarly, we did the analysis for seasonal, and you, you could see obviously there is a there is a lot of better correlations at different proxy level, especially for SIF and KNDVA. Next one, please. But when we go, like when we again increase the temporal winds, you could see it almost caught the neon's correlation. It seems that like uh, it it almost replicate both the neon and the CTSM in terms of SIF as well as KNDV. Next, please. So they do. Unfortunately, we couldn't able to have a very good relation just for these evergreen native forest sites. But apart from that one, we have a very prominent uh, results. Next one, please. Just all across DBF sites and the cropland sites they, they, where they had the maximum correlations compared to the neon observations. Next, please. So uh, again, uh, in order to see how uh, these proxies has been modulating at different sites, we bin uh, at like annual level. So we just bin the sites that has having the same PFD background. So here we are representing the deciduous broadleaf site of for, for us where you could see the first panel represents the neon mean observations, and the next one is CTSM and KNDVA and SIP. We neglected uh, NARV because it, it is like, uh, it, it doesn't give a, a proximal value corresponding to the other proxies. So again, uh, for, like you could see SIF, the last panel, it tries to replicate the neon observations. And uh, like still we are like, we are wondering how it is possible for a KNDVA in order to have a a proper replication of CTSM, which is having again a steep towards April and May, but then again it tries to capture the same seasonality. Next one, please. Similarly, uh, we just uh, bin at different PFTs and we try to find the annual dynamics. Next, please. So this is for cropland and uh, this is for evergreen where we could see the seasonality. Next one, please. 
and this is for grassland and this one is for next please this is for grassland sorry shrubland unfortunately again uh, because of uh, data constraints and there is a lot of noises between in the reflectance product we couldn't able to properly establish a relation with the neon observations neither a proxy nor the model could able to have a very good relation just for this uh, shrubland next one please likewise we been based upon different climatic background and again we found that like a uh, csb which is a humid climate and dfb which is hot summer uh, mediterranean or humid climate has again it dominated the whole shift where ctsm and kndv again it matches and sif it goes along with the neon it shows that like sif is trying to go capture the footprint of neon fluxes whereas kndv is trying to go with the ctsm next one please so uh, we just like try to go on an overall correlation at different levels in order to see how each pfts has been performing at different proxies uh, without doubt obviously this just probably for us which is having a higher canopy architecture it has a very good uh, relation irrespective of the proxies especially for kndv and sif just over neon and uh, ctsm similarly grassland is have again grassland is grassland and uh, cropland they do have a very good relation with sif as well as with kndv you know, irrespective of the uh, proxies but unfortunately we couldn't able to have establish a proper relation with ctsm and kndv for the shrubland background uh, pft next please similarly we did uh, the same for climatic background we found that like csc and dfc we couldn't able to have a better relation that because C has been csa is having uh, sites that have data gaps and both represents evergreen needle forest and again dfc has been represented by another evergreen needle forest but we couldn't able to establish a proper relation but dfb which is a humid uh, uh, humid subtropical climate background where most of the sites has a background of uh, deciduous broadleaf forest again has dominated the whole uh, the proxies as well as with the observation next one please so uh here uh, over here we are trying to go like again we are trying bringing back the temporal bins in order to go with different time scales where you could see the panel over here we compare the correlation between ctsm and kndv and we observe that like a different temporal bins like each bins represents different uh temporal bins for example the gold and the blue represents the annual and the interannual bins and that seems having the higher uh, correlation especially when we are comparing with proxies likewise we did the same next one please we did the same for like different uh, pfts irrespective of uh, the different proxies where you could see higher the proxies like uh, the irrespective of the proxies the higher uh, the temporal bins the higher the correlations between these uh, model simulations as well as with the satellite proxies this shows that like irrespective of uh, the uh, irrespective of the proxies the uh, the satellite goes along with the uh, 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 with the model simulations and they go along well with the different pfts as well, as well. next please so uh, so you could see that like uh, except for evergreen needle forest which is in the middle panel uh, all the other site has a very good relation especially for annual and interannual bins but for evergreen needle forest uh, we couldn't able to have a proper uh, a proper um, higher correlation that's because again uh, it we do uh, have a data gaps in the sites that we simulated but then uh, again we do find a lot of environmental noises over back just for the site and we are trying to expand this analysis in order to understand how well uh, this has been uh, globally uh, represented at different sites next please likewise again we classify these sites based upon the climatic background and again uh, irrespective of the climate or the pfts temporal bins when you increase at uh, higher temporal bins it seems higher uh, correlations with proxies observations and the satellites next please so we uh, like we try to uh, expand our analysis on a global scale so we just like uh, simulated a global uh, ctsm for the same period from 2018 to 2022 and similarly we collected the data for kndva and ard and so irrespective of sites we do have a lot of variable annual dynamics just in the tropics 
But then if you could look in the temperate region, just over in Europe, the different uh, proxies has a difference of opinions in terms of uh, compared to CTSM. Similarly, over there in the boreal forest, this shows that like again, uh, sites in boreal forest do have uh, like difference in variability, which we are trying to expand our analysis in the future uh, research. Next, please. But when we try to correlate it with the CTSM observations on a global scale, we try to look a lot of invariant, lot of uh, negative correlations has been observed just for the tropics. That because like again, these are the regions where you have a tropical forest with like higher canopy architecture. Wherever you have higher uh, canopy architecture, the region seems to have a lot of uh, variabilities that has been observed throughout this whole presentation. But uh, again, uh, it seems that like except NARB. SIP seems to have a good correlation with CTSM over boreal and the tropical uh, and the temperate regions over there in Europe. But NARV is the only uh, proxy where we couldn't have a proper uh, having a negative correlation just over there in, in the boreal forest. Next, please. So uh, with that, I'll just like summarize uh, the work that we did. So initially, we tried to understand how environmental factors have been playing their role at different uh, structure. We consider that latent heat and temperature has been driving GPP at like mostly over this year's broadleaf site and grassland. But as there's been a lot of biases between uh, latent heat of uh, the absorbed latent heat and the simulation one, because just because they are having a higher canopy of structure and they have larger bias. But when it comes to precipitation, it just goes uh, having a good correlation for the grassland site. But other, other than that, we don't have established a proper uh, significant correlation for the climatic source. But other than that, temperature and uh, BPD have a very good agreement for uh, neon observations, whereas uh, latent heat having a very good a very good relation with the CTSM simulations. Uh, similarly, see, grassland is the only site which is having a stronger relation uh, irrespective of different proxies. Even though uh, KNDV have a uh, a, a, a lesser uh, representation for higher canopy. Grassland is a particular site where it had a stronger, consistent uh, correlation for with different uh, proxies. But when it comes to PFT gradients, you could see that like CTSM has been like always outperformed by neon, where CTSM is underrepresented almost like uh, just for the DBF sites. So irrespective of uh, uh, the climatic background, except for DBF. Uh, the uh, CTSM has been like uh, overrepresented, whereas they are having a good relation with uh, CTSM. And the very good proxy that has been observed over this has been considered to be SIP. So they have a stronger seasonal correlations as well as well as annual relation, except for grassland and cropland. And uh, when it comes to the shrubland, neither model nor proxy could able to capture a proper dynamics across the seasonal, neither seasonal nor the annual dynamics just for the uh, shrubland sites. When it comes to the climate gradient, uh, the CFA type and the DFD, which is a, a subtropical humid climate, have exhibited a significant correlation irrespective of the proxies uh, across different temporal bins. And similarly, uh, CSA and DFD bins has having a stronger disagreements with different proxies. When it comes to the temporal gradient aspect, we, we again find that like uh, the lower the temporal bins, it seems like we couldn't able to establish a proper significant correlations between proxies and observation. But when when we increase the temporal bins, it seems that like correlation seems to having an upscale, especially on the higher temporal bins. And with that, I would like to uh, conclude my talk, and I'll take some questions now. Thank you, Manoj. Um, everyone feel free to add your questions to the question and answer box in the Zoom interface. Um, I can go ahead and start with one question though. Um, so how do you think uh, the plant functional type impacts the, the modeled outputs. Do you feel that using something like FATES, um, where you can provide 
percentages of plant functional types across the site um, to kind of better characterize the site could improve this. Uh, no, again, uh, since CLM is using a consistent data, uh, I mean, uh, PFT types, which is again around 78 PFT types, it is hard for us to again uh, go with the percentage. Again, we could uh, uh, differentiate each site based upon their uh, uh, ecological background. Again, uh, NEON has its own uh, vegetational characteristics for each site, but then we didn't go based upon the NEON. We just thought uh, in order to go with the, on an ambiguity scale, so we just try to stick with the uh, CT, uh, CLM uh, based PFT types. But then uh, based upon the uh, ground variations again these uh, results may change and obviously it will change because again we do uh, obviously found some changes within the site level with uh, different pft background as well i mentioned it um in the chat but just if anyone wants to make a comment or ask a question over audio there is a raise hand button in your zoom menu and so if you do that we can unmute you and allow you to join the conversation. Um, I can ask another question. So I, I kind of following up on the importance of vegetation, because that was interesting that you, you were pointing out that certain satellite proxies were better at matching the observation, depending on whether there was essentially like short stature, like not structurally complex vegetation versus tall stature, structurally complex like forests. And I wondered if you could speak more like, why do you think that is? Why does, you know, NDVI, I think it was better in grasslands with SIF or vice versa in forests. Like what is going on there, that interplay between what the satellite is picking up and the structure of the vegetation? Yeah, uh, the characteristics of SIF is just like they are capturing just the particular wavelength of reflective band that has been emitted from plants. So they could able to capture even though if they have a sparse or like a structurally composed vegetational characteristics. But when it comes to modus, which is uh, like a, which is having a multi from a multi uh, optical band, they, they, they don't have a proper algorithm in order to differentiate between the background or uh, the, uh, the vegetational structure over the particular region. And that, that's why there has been a lot of noises, especially for shrubland varieties of uh, types where neither of uh, the uh, satellites, like even though they do have a different background, neither could able to have a proper relation for, uh, especially for the shrubland type. But when it comes to uh, cropland, SIF and KNDV tries to match with the same. But then they do have different personalities because the uh, the reflectance where uh, SIF captures is around like 750 to 800 micrometer, whereas uh, the KNDV is just like an indices that we develop. So. Again, we do expect a lot of the similarities between these two proxies. I'll also add that um, the different spatial resolution of the SIF related to uh, the NIR, NIRV um, mm -hmm. could potentially have play a role as well. I was wondering, you know, if, if we were able to get a better kind of spatial resolution cut out around the neon tower it yeah. might improve that relationship, right? Um, if we were able to, yeah. <clears throat> I mean, you mentioned shrubland, so we could talk a little more about that because I thought that's really interesting that drylands that tend to be shrubby were very poorly simulated, it seemed across the board, like neither the proxies nor the models seemed like they were yeah. doing a great job. Yeah. Um, could you elaborate more on what you think is going on there? Like, were you just sort of alluding to the fact that there's not much leaf biomass? It's like a lot of woody biomass or why Why are we having such trouble in shrublands and what do you think we could do about that? Still shrubland is a mystery for us because like even Neon could able to establish a proper annual or seasonal dynamics. Again, we do have a lot of data gaps, especially for the shrubland side. So uh, like they are mostly um, kind of like subtropical climate. So again, uh, we do consider like climate might influence a larger larger background on the perspective. But then since uh, like we do have a lot of data gaps in Neon, we couldn't establish a very good, a significant results in order to portray what's happening in, real, in reality. But then if you could compare SIF, if you just take SIF, they do capture 
uh, a double hump seasonality like in the early spring like in spring and in, in summer so it might capture it may capture the structure unless until uh, we do have a proper observation of uh, shrublands we won't be able to uh, like validate it with those so still we are in a mystery phase i will i will point out that um there are some issues with precipitation data products at, at grassland sites in particular. Um, and it's partly due to uh, the fact that there's not replicate data stream. So a lot of the gap filling was performed using a replicate data stream structure um, and relationships between these replicate data streams. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, at these grassland sites, we, we've had a, we, we have a known issue that we're working on. Um, and uh, one potential answer is being worked on uh, by Tegan King at NCAR. So she's working yeah. on developing some, yeah. some data yeah. using PRISM, yeah, um, to be able to uh, initialize the model using the PRISM yeah. data as well, so. Yeah, PRISM do show uh, like a strong correlation with at these other sites, but then uh, still again, there's been a lot of variability at uh, neon observations as well. Any more questions from the crowd? Quiet crew today or any comments for Manoj? I think he's still working on writing this up, so. Yeah. These are all just like the preliminary results we are still working on. And we are just like, uh, we, we are confused how to portray our uh, results because it's just like, we need to represent each site and have to re represent all the results. So. We're just like again still finding an effective way to represent our results. Refining the story. Yep. A lot of interesting work though. It's an exciting way to see the application of neon data and neon combined with model simulations. I think it's really cool. Um Dave, did you have anything else? Otherwise, maybe we'll end a few minutes early. No, I I think it's really interesting work, Manoj. And um I'm curious too uh, if maybe we could adapt some of the work you've done to to work with AOP data or AOP remote sensing proxies at some point. I think that would be very interesting as well. Um, but. That would be great. Yeah, sure. AOP is the airborne observation platform. It's our neon yeah. airborne remote sensing payload, which obviously don't cover the whole globe. They give us a very fine scale hyperspectral remote sensing at the neon site. So some cool avenues for future research there, absolutely. Yeah, we do right. plan to use uh, the uh, neon uh, drone observation that we try to, but then none of them could able to, like we couldn't able to properly match temporally with the observations that we manage. So we thought of excluding the analysis over there. Okay, thank you, thank you. Manoj for taking the time to, to give this great presentation. And thank you, Samantha, for, for organizing. Um, I guess with that, we'll wrap up a little bit early and give people back some time. Thank yeah. You. So, yeah, this was our last science seminar for kind of this academic year, if you will. We'll be taking the, the summer off, and then we're going to start back up in September with another series of um, hopefully very interesting and stimulating neon science talks. It'll be same time and a monthly schedule. And we're also going to ramp up another um the paired series of data skills webinars so look for some more communications on that thank you all so much and have a great rest of your day